All right. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm, uh, my name is Nate Sims. I'm uh, very happy to be here uh, to give this presentation, uh, Introduction to the Irma or Chiang uh, Language. <clears throat> so uh, kind of a roadmap of what I'd like to cover in this presentation is to give a introduction to the speakers of this language, uh, some discussion of the sociolinguistic situation uh, for the people who speak it, and then the rest of the time to talk a little bit about the structure of the language itself. So we'll discuss a bit of the phonology, the sound system of the language, um, covering uh, briefly um, the consonants, the vowels, what is the nature of the syllable in the language, and also the role of tone uh, in uh, the language. And then uh, after that, to talk a little bit about the larger structures, um, some of the more interesting structures of the language are, are the verbs and the verbal morphology. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about the spatial prefixes, a little bit about this uh, idea of associated motion, and uh, to give you not a, a full account of the verbs, but just an appreciation for uh, this kind of uh, intricate and complicated part of the language. There's not as much to say about the nouns, and so we'll, we'll talk a bit about the verbs. Um, okay, so uh, Irma, the Irma language um, is also called Chiang. I'll talk about that here in a minute, but it's um, part of the Trans-Himalayan language family, meaning that it is related to Chinese, to Tibetan, and also to Burmese. Those are probably uh, the major languages that maybe some of you all are familiar with. Um, and within that family tree, it's probably closest related to Burmese. I think it's not a uh, definitive yet. Um, there's still some work being done in the, the history of the language, but uh, probably fair to say that of those three major um, languages, it's closest related to Burmese. So it's spoken uh, within what is now Sichuan province in uh, the People's Republic of China, uh, principally along the Min River. So we see uh, this arrow here on the screen. Um, um, let's see if I can do this uh, else. Okay, yeah, so I'll, up along the, the Min River, um, in between, kind of wedged in between the Sichuan Basin and the, the Tibetan Plateau. Um, so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the situation for the language. There are probably about 100,000 speakers of the language. It's hard to gauge exactly, but I think that's a fair estimate. So it's a, a you know, relatively large um, number of speakers. And there's some issues um, worth discussing about uh, who the people are that speak this language. So there's a, a Chinese term, uh, Qiang, spelled Q-I-A-N-G, um, with this character uh, here to the left. Um, and this is a very old term. So even in some of the earliest Chinese writings, this um, ethnonym occurs, and it probably meant um, anyone to the west of Chinese territorial control at that time. So the, another term is the Western Qiang. And uh, this term is very old. It, it probably was uh, more broadly used for different peoples uh, in the Western regions. And um, with the founding of the People's Republic of China, uh, there came to be a classification of all the peoples within China. And it was fixed at 56 different ethnicities. And so Qiang is one of these 56 different ethnicities. Um, Irma is the term that Qiang people call themselves um, or a variant of this word. Sometimes it's Ma, sometimes Mer, sometimes Irma or Jme. There's many different uh, dialectal variants, but Irma is kind of used to, to encompass all of these different uh, terms that people call themselves. Traditionally, um, they were agriculturalists who um, lived in these kind of deep valleys along the Min River. So they're not pastoralists, although some people kept uh, yaks and goats and still do today, uh, but mostly um, subsistence agriculturalists. And um, there's a kind of split uh, within the people who speak the Irma language between those that are classified by the Chinese government as Qiang and those that are classified by the Chinese government as Tibetan. And this is primarily um, has to do with religion. So the people who follow Tibetan Buddhism uh, closer to the Tibetan plateau in the Northwest have been designated Tibetans. And the people who are non-Buddhists or animists or shamanists in the Southeast are the Qiang nationality. So it's, it's something of a kind of India, Pakistan 
uh, situation uh, for this um, split. So, you know, people have different ideas. Some people who are um, uh, Tibetan ethnicity, they recognize that oh, we speak the same language as the Chiang people next door to us. And some people say, actually, no, that's a separate language. So there's, it's a very kind of contentious issue uh, that you, you can find um, uh, varying opinions uh, on all sides of this, but um, primarily a split between about half of the speakers who are considered Tibetan, half of them are considered Chiang. Um, in any case, uh, there's, the language is endangered um, because of increasing influence of mainly uh, Mandarin. So there's extensive bilingualism with Mandarin. I have not really, I've been you know, going to this area for some time and um, been involved with Chiang language and Irma language documentation since about 2006. And most everyone I've met speaks some level of Chinese. So Chinese is really um, uh, gaining in popularity in Chiang where Irma is, is on the decline generally. Uh, there's some writings if, for people who are interested by uh, an anthropologist named Wang Mingke, who has written about the history of this kind of contentious designation of people as either uh, Tibetan or Chiang ethnicity. So um, well, here on the map on the screen, we see Sichuan province uh, outlined. Uh, and then in the uh, yellow region, this is the Aba prefecture of Sichuan province in the Northwest. The red area here is Mao County. That's where the majority of Chiang ethnicity or Ma speakers live. Um, it's kind of the most uh, um, condensed uh, place where people, where people live that speak, speak Chiang. So today we'll be talking about one dialect uh, within Mao County, which is the Yonghe Township uh, dialect. So I have kind of the structure of Yonghe Township within Mao County, within the prefecture in Sichuan province here at the bottom. Um, this is kind of just to give an idea of what is around uh, this area. It's a very nice uh, graphic from, from Gongxun, a person who's worked on the Jiarongic languages uh, in Sichuan. And so you see Chiang here um, towards the southeast, neighboring the Jiarong languages, and also Amdo Tibetan to the north, and then Chinese to the south. So this graph is also nice because it illustrates that there's been a lot of work done on the neighboring languages in terms of their internal structure and subgrouping, but not so much on Chiang. So there's, there's really um, not as much uh, that we can say for certain about the dialect uh, situation. But here's a, a rough introduction to the, to the uh, dialects of Irma. So we have in this red circle, uh, what is typically, typically called Northern Irma. And Within this circle, uh, the dialects are pretty homogenous. People can understand each other if they're well-intentioned uh, within this area generally, maybe at the borders, the extreme, extreme edges, maybe not so much, but it's um, thought to be kind of a later expansion uh, historically because it's more internally homogenous. Outside of this, uh, you see the, the blue circles are what is called Southern Irma, and um, they're less internally homogenous. So, people from these different areas uh, within the blue circles may or may not be able to communicate effectively with each other in Irma. And most of the time they would use Chinese as a language um, to communicate with each other. This yellow line here shows the division between uh, where people to the Northwest are considered Tibetan and to the Southeast of that yellow line considered uh, Chiang. And so we see that the ethnic boundary um, is, is one that is, it corresponds with the county line but not necessarily with the dialectal uh, division. So today we'll be talking about uh, the Yonghe dialect, which is um, the dialect I've done uh, the most research on and have been friends with speakers of this dialect um, for some time now. It's the easternmost dialect of, of Irma, so it's interesting in that respect and hasn't really been studied as much as some of the, uh, the west, northwestern uh, dialects. Um, so this is just a picture of my, my friend's grandmother whose uh, uh, family has taught me about uh, Chiang. I went to Chinese public school and in middle school became friends with um, my friend whose his family spoke Yonghe Chiang or Yonghe Ma. And um, this is the traditional attire for women in this area. It's unique to this valley. So we might imagine in another political context that uh, it would be considered maybe it's its own language or uh, that the, these people would be considered a separate ethnicity. You know, they only really identify with other people from the valley. 
and not so much with the other uh, Irma speaking peoples. So it's a it's a unique um, kind of uh, subculture within Mao County is this the Yongha Valley. Um, to give an idea just about a little bit more about um, the sociolinguistic situation, I have this map here uh, with the help of Google. So the, the red dots here represent villages within the Yongha Valley where Irma is no longer spoken by, by either old people or young people, just uh, people speak Chinese exclusively. Uh, the yellow or orange circles here represent villages where Irma is still spoken, um, but uh, not by children. So only in these uh, kind of far north, uh, re more remote villages represented with the orange triangles do you see um, places where Irma is still spoken by children, it's still being acquired and, and used uh, more in daily life. So you see this is kind of a, a microcosm for the whole area in that uh, Qiang or Irma language use is on the decline and um, being replaced with Chinese. It's also the case um, that the more remote villages are uh, more economically challenged. And so there's a negative connotation or a stereotype sometimes with people who speak uh, Irma as being, you know, let, uh, having less access to education and, and being um, backwards in some way. So that's it also contributes um, to the decline of the language uh, and that situation is rather unfortunate, but that's that's the case um, for uh, the Yonha Valley in many ways. All right, so let's talk about the, the structure of this uh, particular dialect. All I'm going to say is, uh, you know, uh, restricted to just this one dialect, although there's some similarities with others. Um, so we'll start with looking at the consonants um, for this dialect. We see there are a large number of consonants um, with different consonants at many places of articulation. Um, so um, bilabial, alveolar, retroflex, palatal, velar, and glottal. Uh, a large number of fricatives, which is somewhat typologically uh, unusual, um, but not necessarily for, for this region. Uh, so we'll just talk a little bit about this, um, this three-way distinction for the, um, for the uh, obstruents, so the, the um, distinction here between uh, ba pa ba, da ta da, and for the velars, ga ka ga. Uh, for the Africans, you have a parallel distinction, um, za cha za, ja cha ja, and jia cha jia. So this is a, this three-way distinction um, that's uh, found in most Irma dialects. Um, but what's noteworthy here is actually the absence of uvular sounds. Uh, uvular sounds like ka and ka are found in a lot of uh, the neighboring dialects, but not, not in this dialect. So my suspicion is that that's a kind of influence of Chinese and that this is a loss in this dialect. So we see a, a fairly robust uh, consonant inventory uh, with these three-way uh, voicing distinctions. Okay. Uh, for the vowels, you have a um, somewhat asymmetrical vowel system, uh, eight different vowels, um, with uh, the primary vowel distinction being between the front vowels and the back vowels, so the front four vowels and the back four vowels. And we see this kind of pattern happen uh, where vowels will change depending on their environment uh, called vowel harmony. And so we might see um, for uh, this front back vowel assimilation for the vowels, where um, we have a in the, the first form here, the verb is ya to be good. If someone were to say still good, there's a continuative aspect prefix which marks um, continuation of that state. So da ya, still good. Um, if we say need, uh, ji, um, da ji, still needs, um, or ye to live, da ye, and then chu to pick, da chu. So these all have this front vowel a. Uh, for the back vowels, for, for verbs that start with a back vowel, like ne, lodi, wu, and lade, um, we have the back vowel on the prefix. So da ne, da lodi, da wu, and da lade. So this is um, uh, an area of interest in the language that the vowels change, especially uh, for the prefixes, uh, depending on the um, vowel of the verb stem. So. This is the continuative aspect prefix. We'll talk a little bit more about the verbs um, here uh, in a minute. But going back to the, the sound structure, um, this is the, the 
uh, layout for the syllable structures that we find in the language. It's relatively simple and straightforward. We have um, five different types of syllables. Uh, the first type, consonant vowel, so this verb ha, to be free or to, to be leisurely. Um, number two, you can have a, a consonant, a glide, and then a vowel, so hua, to sell. We can have um, some instances where we have closed syllables, but only in rare instances um, that are actually, in all cases, borrowings from Chinese, where you can have a nasal uh, coda to the syllable, uh, han ta, to call someone, and then huan ta, to change. So these are, are borrowings from Chinese han and, and huan. You can also have a, a consonant uh, coda, which is a glide, um, and only in some derived cases. So this uh, verb hua to sell, if there's a certain evidential marking that comes at the end of the, the verb, then you would say huai, you know, something like, um, it's it marks degree of certainty, uh, but it's the same verb with a, a, a glide coda. So this is actually simple um, consonant invent or a syllable template compared to a language like Tibetan or some of the Jiarongic uh, languages, which have very uh, large uh, inventories of possible syllables. Um, so what's the reason for this? Um, uh, mostly simplification. So we see if we compare uh, Yonghe with other Irma dialects, uh, we see that uh, they've lost the complex onsets. So we have the Shpa type onsets from Ronghong, which is more conservative. Cons uh, those uh, correlate with the H uh, fricative onset in Yonghe. So Shpie, Fa, Shpe, Fe, Shpa, Far, and so on. And then the voiced uh, complex onsets in Ronghong correspond with the voiced uh, counterpart in Yonghe. So Zhbe corresponds with V, Zhbu uh, corresponds with uh, uh, V. So um, there's a reduction in complexity that has led to this kind of simple uh, syllable template. Uh, we see all the uh, also with the um, loss of codas. So there's there's only open syllables in the language. If we compare it with a language like Tibetan, which preserves the consonant codas of earlier stages, um, we see that uh, these have been lost in Yonghe in a predictable way. So for these um, the last four words on this in this table, uh, the Tibetan forms and the the pre-Tibetan forms have K as the coda. And this has been lost in Yonghe. Um, and with the reflex of a rising tone. So um, certain syllable types that were complex have become more simple, but there's been a compensatory uh, development of a tonal contrast. So we see a high tone for these um, first four words in Yonghe that have no obstruent codas in Tibetan. And then for the last four words, we have the K coda in Tibetan. Um, and this corresponds with a rising tone in Yonka. So I think uh, there's more work to be done on this to say for certain, but there's kind of promising line of uh, inquiry to see, okay, where um, have the codas been lost and what is the, the influence of those on the, the syllables? Okay. All right, so we still have some time to talk about the verb. Um, and uh, it's typologically an agglutinative language. So you find um, strings of affixes, uh, both prefixes and suffixes that come on either side of the verb stem, which add meaning to the verb. So we have the stem here, this would be this core part of the verb. We can have up to three prefixes, an orientational or spatial marking prefix, a negative prefix, the continuative aspect prefix, which we've already seen, and uh, a set of suffixes as well, which I probably won't have time to talk about. So we'll talk mostly about the prefixes here. Um, although there's the causative marking suffix, an associated motion suffix, so it adds an element of motion, come, and, come or go, essentially, to the verb. Uh, there's an applicative marking suffix, which adds an argument uh, to, the, to the verb. So instead of, you know, um, to, um, to do something versus to do something for someone. So that would be the, the difference of the applicative. And then there's person marking an evidential marking, which we won't discuss today. Okay, so let's take the first category of the verb, uh, which are these orientational prefixes. 
and within that category, there are eight different markers. So we have da upwards, ra downwards, na upriver, sa downriver, a uh, in inwards, ha outwards, za towards, and da away. So these are organized into four different axes, um, having to do with up down, up or down river, uh, containment, and then uh, towards and away. So uh, some verbs. Um, the, the prefixes, again, we see this issue of vowel harmony. So the uh, prefix form will change depending on the verb as well. So that was the case for the continuative as aspect prefixes. And also for these, um, this is just the inwards prefix. When it occurs with different verbs, there's up to five different vowel qualities that the verb can have. Um, and so um, one of the interesting things about this uh, use of the orientational prefixes is that it's similar to in English, we have uh, phrasal verbs like uh, listen listen up or quiet down. So the, the analogy here would be, it's as if, um, you know, the language has that kind of tendency to use direction with the verbs, but then it, it kind of went totally bananas and just became totally obligatory where uh, every verb has a specific uh, direction that it occurs with in different aspects. So it's something that has to be learned when you learn the language, okay, um, to, to listen or to hear, that takes the inwards prefix. So some of them are intuitive and some of them are, are not so intuitive and just have to be learned. Okay, so with some verbs, uh, they can take all eight different directions. So this motion verb like fly, in the past tense, um, what's effectively the past tense, it has to take a prefix and it has to take one of these eight. So flew up, flew down, or, or so on. Um, and then for some verbs, it, the, the verb can't take all of the prefixes, uh, but can take a subset of those. So we see these cases are somewhat interesting, um, these antonymic pairs. So deru to stand upright, eru to stand something upside down. Um, sometimes they're less intuitive or, or more, they need to be learned. So you have a pair like tapa, which is the upwards prefix. It means um, to bloom of a flower. And then apa, the downwards prefix, means for the stars to come out at night. So there's some connection there, uh, but the, the difference in prefix uh, actually gives a different meaning to the verb. Uh, somewhat like English, uh, listen in versus listen up. You might think of it that way. So we have ver a verb like who, when, when it's used with the upwards prefix, means to win and with the downwards prefix means to lose. So there's some uh, metaphorical import of these prefixes. And then something like zada to say, with the upwards prefix dazda to tell someone, azda, uh, downwards prefix to explain. So there's kind of a, a top to bottom uh, metaphor there as well, to talk down to someone or to explain to them. Uh, so this is um, a very kind of complex uh, element of the language, not only because you have to learn which prefix goes with which verb, but also what the pattern is for changing the vowel of the prefix depending on the verb. Um, so it's, um, it's kind of the, the key issue if you were to uh, set out to learn to speak or ma would be uh, figuring out these, these prefixes. Um, let's see, so well, I have um, some time here uh, to talk about some of the, the more complex uh, verbs now that we have some idea of, of what the different components of them are, we can talk about some of these maximally uh, complex verbs, uh, which would correspond to kind of sentences in English. So we have uh, in number one, um, this sentence, so you haven't, gone, you haven't yet gone to wipe it down for them. Um, and this would be, amada made giwunisa. Okay. Uh, this is from a text, um, and uh, so ah is the downwards directional prefix, ma is the negative prefix, da is the yet, contributes the yet meaning, made is the stem, meaning to wipe, uh, gi is a verbal suffix, which means go, wu to do something for someone, so you haven't gone to wipe it down for them uh, yet, and then ni is the second person marker. So. All of this meaning condensed into one verb. There's a particle at the end, which is kind of more of an attitudinal uh, particle. So I have, so you haven't done it yet. Um, and then um, we have uh, in number two, um, the sentence, a mother had not yet gone to bring down the pig foot. Um, 
So badger by madadjigi. So here we see um, this prefixal string. What I wanted to point out um, in this example, we have the same set of prefixes, e, me, da, direction marker down, negative marker, continuative aspect, and then the verb stem bring. But the, the entire string of prefixes, e, me, da, and amada from the first ones, uh, they, they all vary because of the verb, uh, because of the vowel of the verb stem. The first vowel of the verb stem in the first example is a, and so all of the prefixes harmonize with that. And then for the second example, we see all of the prefixes em et da harmonizing with this front vowel ju, or this front vowel u. Um, there's kind of a split in the verb of the language where the prefixes behave one way and the suffixes behave another way. So there's no um, vowel harmony for the suffixes. We see this ki occurs after the front vowel uh, here. I guess this is also a front vowel, but there's the, the, the suffix yi to go never undergoes any alternation, neither do any of the other suffixes. So it's uh, kind of the prefixes go together with the stem and then the suffixes are kind of tacked onto that. Um, uh, oftentimes the, the stem will have the first high tone in the word, so it's kind of demarcated in that way where all the prefixes will be low up until the stem. And then uh, the suffixes are actually more variable, so sometimes the suffixes can have high tone or low tone, uh, but the prefixes tend to operate as a unit. So, okay. Uh, one other thing uh, to mention here is the relationship between the orientational prefixes and the suffix go, right? So um, in the example of the pig foot, um, it's not that this direction orientational marker down applies to the motion of going. So the mother didn't go down to get the pig foot. She brought down the pig foot and she went to go bring down the pig, pig foot. Um, and this example is from a story in Chiang traditional households, uh, uh, pig feet and other cured meats are stored on the top level of the house and hung from the rafters. So the mother would have actually gone up from the living room to go get the pig foot. Um, and so this the scope of the um, orientational markers doesn't really apply beyond the stem. So there's kind of a, a, a what I'm getting as a, a clear um, demarcation of that the stems and the prefixes go together and then the, the suffixes um, behave differently. So um, in this case, she would have gone up to go bring down the pig foot. Um, and so the, the downwards marker here uh, refers to the action of bringing, bringing it down, but not the going. Okay, so um, yes, this is, uh, these are some, you know, the, the more complicated verb examples from the language. Uh, not all verbs are this complex, but this is this is kind of the maximal complexity. So very different um, from Chinese um, and also quite different from Tibetan, uh, which um, has some agglutinative tendencies, but not not as much as as uh, Irma. So uh, hopefully I've given people an overview um, of uh, the people who speak the language and then uh, some of the, the structure of the language. So I think that is uh, all I have uh, prepared for today. And uh, would like to uh, thank you all for your time and uh, express my gratitude uh, to my friends from the Yonka Valley for uh, sharing their language and their time with me uh, over the years. Uh, it's been a great privilege to be able to study this language. Um, so I think that's uh, all I'll say for now.